Hey guys, this is episode three of Two Kids in a Trench Coat, a football podcast. I am Jacob Rosenfarb. And I'm Ryan Sharp. And I'm Josh Sackless. So the NFL draft just concluded this past weekend, and um, there are obviously some pretty incredible takeaways. Yeah. So so Ryan, what's your what's your first big takeaway from this draft? Uh, first big takeaway, I think, is uh, should match up with the first pick in the draft, and that would be the Cleveland Browns taking Baker Mayfield, 2017 Heisman winner. I was quite shocked at that move. Oh my God! I, we we were all watching together just to just to let the listener know and my god we were just going yeah going ridiculous um, i'd say that was the loudest the room got at any point during the night um i know i said the f word pretty loud and i was uh (laughs) i was shocked disappointed mostly shocked um good for baker mayfield though you know yeah two-time walk-on heisman winner first pick in the draft it's a pretty impressive resume and uh i wish him the best in cleveland yeah, I um I think he's gonna succeed. It was a it was a weird pick though. I really I really at the end of the day disagree with why the pick. yeah, me too though. I, why, why not take Sam Darnold? Yeah, I I I am I am pressed to see what they really loved more about Baker. Yes, I definitely like Baker for sure, but um if I'm a general manager and I could have one of those two, yeah, it's gonna Dar- be Sam Darnold. Darnold to me just makes way more Darnold's just a way safer pick, is a way more I mean um, it's it's a more basic pick, which I get. I guess if you're going looking for the outside of the box, looking for kind of a you know game changer sort of quarterback, I think Baker probably fits that mold a little better. But, but they already tried that. I know, yeah, exactly. and it did not work out well for them. I'm not saying they're the same person. I think uh, Baker Mayfield has a bit more of a work ethic, you're at least com- at this point in their careers. Than comparing Johnny him to did. Johnny Manziel. Okay, yeah. good. Just want to clarify. Um, first. so I think the work ethic is definitely a huge thing there, but um. In terms of eccentricity, I don't know how well that's going to work out for Cleveland. Just a lot of controversy with Johnny Football, so we'll see where that goes with Baker. But they're two different people. It's four years removed, so yeah. The the Baker Baker and Johnny comps, I think, are make a lot of sense. I think that's a you know a pretty obvious comparison. I think people have been, but obviously the Browns have some sort of you know measures to to protect themselves against that. I I would hope. I don't know. Um, I think I think he's going to be good. I think Baker's going to be fine. I don't think he's going to be as exceptional as he was in, in, in college. college. I think, like, I don't know. I think kind of what we saw at Oklahoma was a mirage to a certain I extent. I think if I were to predict a Baker Mayfield full season, um, I don't know if he'll start the first game there. I think he might have to, though. If you're going to if you're gonna do something as crazy as take Baker Mayfield with the first pick, I feel like you have to start him day one. You might, honestly. I mean, I'm not sure what he, how he benefits from sitting. sitting. Exactly. What does – I mean, everybody has to learn, obviously. You know, nobody is a perfect – you know, nobody has an NFL mind coming into the league, but he's so mature. He this is this is what he's done is yeah. you know, just kind of come in and take jobs and and you know learn how to do them well exactly so. and learn on the job almost. I don't know. It seems like you're wasting a prime year Baker almost. Yeah. If, if you have a new coach and take your team to the college football playoff, yeah, um, I think that's pretty impressive. So um, if anyone could do it, I would say it's Baker Mayfield. Um, but I probably have to guess. 18 to 20 touchdowns, 3,200 yards. That's uh, that's going to be my regular season prediction for Baker Mayfield. Interesting, interesting. Um, I think I'm probably going a little higher on the on every. I think he probably goes for maybe 38 to 3,900 yards, 25 touchdowns, but also like 13 to 15 picks. I think he's pretty wild with the ball. I think he, yeah. may, you know, I think he tries to make a lot of throws, and sometimes that'll be awesome. Sometimes, you know, whether it's uh, Josh Gordon or Antonio Callaway streaking down the sideline, that's going to be. You know, either one of the, that, that'll another be awesome. surprising pick for me. Exactly, what we're talking about him, yeah. Antonio Callaway in the fourth round. I think that's some value for the Browns. Um, yeah, definitely some value there. But um, again, they're taking a shot on a guy that has some issues in the past. For people that don't know, Antonio Callaway is an inte- incredibly talented wide receiver out of the University of Florida, but he has been busted now three times for marijuana. Um, twice, I want to say it was possession, and then at the combine, he tested positive. Um, he failed the dummy test. Essentially. Exactly, he failed the dummy test. He failed the uh, the best tweet I saw about Antonio Callaway is it's dumb that the NFL still tests for weed, but it's even dumber to smoke when you know you're getting tested. Exactly. So yes, clearly something is um, clearly there's some character issues there. I mean, they've dealt with it before. Um, Josh Gordon. Um, yeah, but how well? Do you really want another Josh Gordon? Yeah, I don't want a guy that's gonna spend you know three full seasons of his prime. You know. <laughs> Not even participating in team activities. So exactly. that'll be interesting to see where that goes. But so, it, go ahead. Baker throwing the ball to Gordon Callaway and Jarvis Landry, I think, uh, 
I think that'll be a fun thing to watch. They have certainly set him up with some weapons. Maybe another season from Njoku, um, you know, all like we said, Landry, Kawe, Coleman, uh, which I'm called Gordon. They have some weapons. So, you know, I think they've put Baker in a pretty good yeah. position to succeed. I see Jarvis Landry a little bit like a safety blanket for Baker. Definitely. Because um, if you just look at his ears, he racks up a bunch of catches. Um, but they're all, you know, seven to ten yards downfield, but that's good, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what you I'd need. rather have a first down than an interception any day of the week. So I think um, having someone to throw the ball to, you know, more of a horizontal threat, um, and Jarvis Landry, I think that's going to help Baker Mayfield out a lot in terms of moving the ball down the field. Yeah, we here at Two Kids in a Trench Coat like to give you the hottest takes that first downs are better than interceptions. Bingo, that's the kind of hashtag yeah. analysis we are providing here at Two Kids in a Trench Coat. Um, if you are a fan that prefers interceptions over first down, while your team has the ball, um, you should probably throw that out there. Then you know the Browns are the perfect team for you. Yeah, hit us up, um, <laughs> and we'll discuss. You know, yeah, well, the pros and cons of your quarterback throwing the ball to the other team. So, uh, so speaking of Baker, speaking of, um, I'm I'm curious about your thoughts about his ability long term. So I'm I'm gonna give you some odds, and I'm uh, I'm curious about your thoughts. Over under two and a half Pro Bowls. For Baker Mayfield. This is an entire career. An entire career over under two and a half Pro Bowls. Live on air mm. response. Excuse the uh, excuse the pause. Yeah. It's a tough question. It is. Right it's now, deep. I'm going to have to say under. Interesting, really. I think he makes more Pro Bowls in his first five years than he does in his second five years. If Interesting. He, if he has a 10-year career, that's the trajectory I see it. Okay. Um, Pro Bowl rookie, perhaps. You know. Wow. Um, fan vote, so, you know. Sure. A yeah, fan yeah. favorite, performing well enough. Um, if he does okay, I could definitely see him making the Pro Bowl. And then maybe another one in the next three to four years. But I think he probably cools off a little bit, or he just falls into that, you know, you're good, but you're – in the 11 to 20 quarterback rankings and just not good enough to be a pro bowler. Interesting. So that kind of, maybe that kind of answers my next question. Over under 0.5 MVPs for Baker Mayfield. Do you ever think Baker Mayfield wins an MVP trophy? I highly doubt it. Interesting. Why not? I just don't think he has all the necessary abilities. Um, I mean, he's been doubted before. Yeah. So if he comes back and, you know, wins three MVPs, you know, I'll eat my words, but... Right now, just I think you're right. What we saw Baker in college definitely a mirage, and I think we'll cool down a little bit. So I'm going to go with no MVPs and under two Pro Bowls. Okay, final question then: over under 0.5 Super Bowls. Does Baker make regard not with the Browns, regard just independent of in his career? Does make Baker is Baker Mayfield ever the starting quarterback on a Super Bowl winning team? What do you think? Josh, feel free to chime in if you. That's want. a tough question. Because yeah. Because well, you, you can. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll buy you some time here, buddy. I know <laughs> that's a tough question. Uh, but it's tough because if you look at some of the past Super Bowl winning quarterbacks, they weren't necessarily great. No, no, no. Like Nick Foles wasn't great. Joe Flacco isn't elite, as we've mm, established. No, I'm joking. Yes, yeah. Joe Flacco's, Joe Flacco's not elite. <laughs> and yet, both of them have won Super Bowls. Yeah. So, really, it's about the talent that. Uh, he's surrounded with um and i guess it's more of a question of if he doesn't win one with the browns how do you see his career progressing and how do you see where do you see him going that's a very good point so what do you think ryan yeah i'm gonna have to go with no super bowls no super bowls wow so you were so you were relatively pessimistic on his career yes interesting um a lot of that has to do with Cleveland, though. I know we just talked Fair. about all the <laughs> weapons he has, and I know we've talked about how Cleveland's going to have a pretty strong defense. Um, but at the end of the day, there's still the Browns. Yeah. <laughs> as, as sad as, just, it is to say. as history has showed us, uh, things don't go their way. And um, I'm going to have to keep with that. I mean, when you retain a coach who has gone one in thirty-one, I don't know. I think that yeah, kind of I see says, a lot of lot of problems with that. That kind of says something about your organization. I don't know. Just a, just a thought. But uh, but let's move on. Let's what other let's talk, let's stay in the top ten. What other what other picks among top among top ten really excited you or really surprised you? Uh, one that really surprised me, the Browns again, is uh, Denzel Ward going at four. Um, I think we both thought Bradley Chubb was the right pick to make there, and then they went with the local guy instead. 
Yeah, I thought that was um, that was gen- honestly a bigger shock to me than one. I thought I had Bradley Ch- Chubb basically penned in. There wasn't even pencil. It was it was permanent marker moved in. You know, on that fourth slot, that made that just made too much sense to me. You know, he's so dynamic off the edge, and it would have been such a great pairing with uh, with Miles Garrett, but decided to go a different direction. Yeah. I'd say I was a little more shocked by one just because I was holding out for Baker to the Dolphins so much, <laughs> um, but definitely a surprising move for the um, Browns to take Denzel Ward instead of Chubb. Now, the Broncos really lucked out getting Chubb at I mean, number five. So. El- Elway said after the draft that if Chubb wasn't there, we would have traded that pick to yeah. the Bills. Like, that was that was where they were trading up to get Allen, you know? So, just think about the The ripple effects of that are, are fascinating. Yeah, you know, how far does the De- whole wormhole there. Exactly. Know? And how far does Denzel Ward fall? How, uh, you know. So does like, he fall to the Chargers? <laughs> Do the Bucks take <laughs> Derwin James? Exactly, exactly. There's there there are a fair amount of uh, possibilities. You know, I think it's a. I'm curious to see how this move plays out. Just because, as much as I love Denzel Ward, I think he's slightly less impressive as a prospect than Chubb, and I think he plays a position of way less value. As much as I love corners in this league, I think um, I think you can construct a system where they're not as important. Where mm-hmm. you can where your pass defense is more utilized by like safeties and a, and a strong pass rush rather than true lockdown corners. And so I'm not sure exactly how vital somebody like Denzel Ward is to a lockdown defense. You know, what do you think? How, how much do you gauge the importance of a generational corner versus a generational pass rusher? Um, that's tough to say. I definitely like the idea of generational pass rusher a little better. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of that just has to do with how long their careers can go. You can be a dominant pass rusher for such a long time. I mean, look at Julius Peppers. Look what yeah, he's doing he's in the league. You know, thirty-eight, and he's still recording double-digit sacks. So that's per- Cameron Wake, thirty-six, twelve sacks last year. Um, you definitely have a lot more longevity when you select a defensive lineman. I think there's just a lot more room for injuries and just wear down when yeah. you're playing corner. You need to really keep a good stamina, and you know. That got harder for me from when I turned 17 to 19. So, you know, if you're going from 22 to 30. Ryan Sharp. Yeah, exactly. Our our NFL caliber athlete, Ryan Sharp over here. I'm just saying, you know, you get older, your stamina goes away a little bit. Um, And you certainly need less of that on a defensive line. Kind of a weird argument to make. Just something I thought of. (laughs) Um, But... Personally, I'm pro D line over shutdown corner. Yeah, I, I get what I'm with it. Um, I think though maybe maybe the Browns had kind of their opponents in mind. You know, Denzel Ward matches up perfectly with Antonio Brown. Mm-hmm. That will be a super fun matchup to watch. Um, I, I don't have the Browns schedule memorized. I don't know when they play the Steelers, but you know twice, that's twice. twice. <laughs> Thanks, boys. Um, so yeah, so twice a year, um, we're gonna be able to you know see that. I think I assume Denzel Ward will follow Antonio Brown around, and that's gonna be a lot of fun. You know, one of the fastest receivers in the league, fastest corners in the league, two kind of freakish athletes. Yeah, maybe another Josh Norman, Odell Beckham Jr. type dynamic. Exactly, big guy. That'll be fun. I like the plus comp. in the AFC North. I, I don't know. I think the Browns and Steelers hate each other a lot. So. Oh man, I feel like all of those teams hate each other. Yeah. I feel like that is certainly one of the more contentious, one of the more bitter oh my divisions God. in football for sure. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so, uh, so moving on, rounding out the top ten for me with the uh, next big shocker. With was the Arizona Cardinals trading up to number 10 to pick Josh Rosen. That was A, surprising, and B, a little heartbreaking. Um, just because, like I said, I was holding out for the Dolphins to take a quarterback. And then the Cardinals traded up. And a uh, little personal story here. We were watching the draft with our good friend Jeff Griffith from the Man the Man podcast. And he happens to be one of the uh, annoying Cardinals fans that live in the Populate Valley the of the yeah. Sun. And he's like, oh my God, yes! And it just really hurt me to see Jeff celebrating. Yeah. Um, we love you, Jeff, but we also hate you. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that first statement, but the, the second one, we hate you, we can definitely get behind that um, here at Two Kids in a Trench Coat. It's just the fact that that happened in front of me, <laughs> that the Cardinals, a team I really... Don't care for as a yeah. fan. Yeah, independent of Jeff, I think we can all say the Cardinals have, have one of the worst fan bases. And then when you add Jeff on top of that, and then, it became a rough night. Yeah, it was rough. But then, you know, Dolphins got Minka, so it's Dol- okay. Dolphins draft Minka, but a- as tough as this will be for you, let's uh, let's focus on the Cardinals and Rose. And what do you think that means for their future? What kind of 
what does this kind of move where they moved up five slots? They uh, you know gave up a handful of late round picks. What is what do you think it says about their trajectory going forward? Well, I definitely think Josh Rosen is better than Sam Bradford. Definitely. I still see Sam Bradford um, starting the season for the Cardinals. Uh, I doubt if he comes out at this point, it's because of injury. It's just because they'll wait until Rosen's ready, and then when he's ready, they'll put him in. Yeah, I think I think Rosen probably needs a year to sit. Probably just you a, think a full year. I mean, I don't. I don't think. I think ideally it would be a full year, but I would be shocked if he doesn't play this year, just because we know Sam Bradford's injury history. We know how good they are. Like if I, there's not a whole lot of talent on that roster. Um, if they are, you know, if they're two and eight, I wouldn't be shocked. Like, yeah, the last six games of the year, we're just gonna give it to Rose and see what he can do, you know. Um, just because I don't think they're gonna be very good this year, so giving to their rookie quarterback makes a lot of sense. What do you think? Do you think? Uh, <laughs> God bless, bless you. you, Josh. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, I guess that's my way of saying that I have two comparisons for Josh Rosen. I can see Josh Rosen really being a um, the next Sam Bradford with his injury history. Um, and kind of the Cardinals looking back in like five, six years being like, wow, that was, that was kind of a waste of time. Or I could see him, and Jeff is loving this comparison as a Cardinals fan, which he should. Um, he thinks he could be the next Aaron Rodgers. Uh, kind of a guy who slipped in the draft, kind of flew under the radar recently, but had a good college career. I think the comparisons to uh, to Aaron Rodgers are interesting. I get them. I think they're very similar personalities, For but sure. that to me is kind of where the similarities end. And yeah, I think that okay. I take that back. I think they also have similar accuracy. I think they, uh, but arm strength wise, I don't think even they're in the same universe. I think Aaron Rodgers is like an all time gunslinger. Yeah, I think at this point he's probably a top twenty quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is maybe top of all fifteen time. of all time. I think he's probably top 10 to me. Top 8. He's, I don't know about 10. In terms top of 10? Oh my, definitely. Oh, yeah. Oof. Eric, ooh, yeah, this'll be... That'll be a good summer podcast that where is, we have nothing to talk about. Perfect. That'll be yeah. good. Oh, um, wow. Okay. I uh, We look forward to that one. We do. We do. I'm excited. Um, but, yeah, so you don't... Sorry, you were saying something about Aaron Rodgers. Oh, yeah, I just think he's uh, one of those guys you just don't see a lot. No. You know, it's just... He's so good. Yeah. And... It's rare to find someone that is just that amazing at the game of football. I mean, a franchise-defining quarterback, you know. There's probably, I'd say, four or five of those in the league right now. Whoa, I don't even have to go with And that might that, be a little that, high. That might be high. To me, it's like Rodgers, Brady. Drew Brees. And then, eh, I don't know if Brees is it. Brees might not be in that category. Not anymore. Yeah, not But anymore. he was. Uh, man, I don't know. I mean, to me, uh, well, that's a different discussion for a different time, but um, I don't I don't think Rosen will ever be a top three quarterback in the league. No, I doubt that. Um, I think I think for Josh's comparisons, I am much more I am much more confident in he, that he turns closer to Sam Bradford than he does yeah. to... Looking back on this draft, um, I was thinking a little bit, is it that the quarterbacks are all really good, or is it that there's just a lot of quarterbacks no, I think we just talked ourselves into these quarterbacks a lot. I really do. Because um, there were so many of them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I think I'm going to butcher the year, but was it 2011 when when Gabbert went 3, Ponder went 12, Locker went 8, eight someone to eight. the Titans? Yeah. That was the year Cam Newton. No, that, no was, that was the year before. Was that? Cam uh, year? 2010? I One of those years. Cam what, Newton? Whatever those years. The year anyway. that I'm talking about. Gabbert, Ponder, Locker. That to me, and then none of them really panned out. Exactly, we all just kind of talked ourselves into these quarterbacks because if you need a quarterback, and you know, and you need you need quarterback early, obviously, and you think, okay, these are the best we got, so we're just gonna we're gonna ride with that. So I don't know. That's I I worry that's not what we're doing here because I think these guys I I want these guys to be good, but I could definitely see us just uh, as a football community just talking ourselves into these prospects because we have to. Uh so we did check it, and. Blaine Gabbert was drafted in 2011, and I believe Cam Newton was back in 2010. Okay. okay. So it was 2011 so. of the year that, that you were referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Producer Josh. Okay. Investigative journalism at its finest right here. Oof. No. Cam Newton was drafted in 2011. Okay. So we were... So what... Remind Factual me. Factual so, error. E. Um, True. Was that the... So was that the draft? Cam Newton went one, and then everybody else after him was rough? Was that... Um, I, I'm mixing. Jake together. Locker was that year. Was that year? So then Gabbert. Uh, that and was Ponder, Blaine Gabbert as well, and I believe Christian Ponder as well. Uh, so only one of them panned out. Yeah, you had you had an MVP winner, and then three duds, three guys who were 
you know, two of them were out of the league within five years. You know, Christian Ponder's most notable achievement is Sam Ponder. You know, I think that's the most notable thing from his career. So, uh, so yeah, we'll see. That's a I I I hope I don't you know hope for that misfortune on anybody in this quarterback class, but just uh, just reality, just reality. And speaking of quarterbacks who might falter, the Buffalo Bills trading up to number seven Again, to Josh Allen to select Josh Allen. What are what were your initial thoughts, and what are your thoughts now that we have a little bit of time to reflect? I was not shocked by that. I thought the Bills were going to do that. Um, and it turns out that was the plan the whole time. It was going to be the Broncos, but then Chubb fell, so they got it from the Bucks instead. And they took Josh Allen. I still don't like Josh Allen. <laughs> no, I feel the same. Not a fan. The whole time, I felt like the Bills were going to do that. They ended up doing it, and I still feel the same as I did about Josh Allen that I did before the draft. Yeah, that might have been the most predictable part of the top ten to me was the Bills trading, trading up, up and taking Josh Allen. Allen. Yeah, 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 that made. Um, I'm, yeah, less enthused about that pick honestly now than I was even when it was a hypothetical. I was not that crazy, and now that it's a reality, I'm I'm even less excited for the Bills. I don't know. I mean, it's gonna be very fun watching Josh Allen complete touchdowns to Minka Fitzpatrick. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I think there's a real good chance. Um, what should we call it? Uh, what's his face? Josh Allen throws more completions to Minka Fitzpatrick than Calvin Benjamin this year. You know that one. That wouldn't be a would be a huge shock to me. All right, so let's just go with the uh, five in the first round. So we're looking at Mayfield, Darnold, Rosen, Allen, and then Lamar Jackson at thirty two. Most and least likely to be a bust. Most likely, definitely Allen. I think we can all we can I both can agree that. Allen is the is the most likely to be a bust. I think least likely to be a true bust where they're like. With out of the league, probably Darnold. I think Darnold's probably the least bust. Maybe I think Darnold close. Darnold least bust, and then Rosen, Mayfield, Jackson, Allen. To me, how about you? What do you I, think? I think that's a very good assessment. I think Darnold is probably um, just looking how he's developed, even in his career at USC. I think he'll continue to do that at a better rate than a lot of the other guys have. I think guys like. Baker Mayfield and Josh Allen, I don't want to say they peaked, but I think they're uh, they're plateauing. So they'll pr- continue to perform at this level, but I don't know if they'll get any better. I think I could definitely get with that. I could I like that term for uh, for Baker plateauing. Um, I I think we kind of seen this with a lot of these quarterbacks that have incredible success in college. Then doesn't exactly translate. You know they still have they still have a a baseline of competency, but. They will never reach a superstardom level as they reached in college. And Darnold has a lot to work on, but I think he knows that. He has a lot to work on, but at the end of the day, he still has these traits, I think, of a franchise quarterback that, yeah. you know, he has the size, he has the, I think he has the the football IQ and the sort of, the wherewithal and the demeanor that really just succeeds at that, at that position. So how many AFC championships do the Jets appear in in Sam Darnold's <laughs> first two years? I'm saying, I'm saying more, in first two years? Yeah, like Mark Sanchez did. Oh. Does that happen again? I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say no. I think uh, I think those Mark Sanchez Jets teams were had more to do with Rex Ryan than uh, than Mark Sanchez. But I I can agree with that as well. But I don't see the Jets in the next two AFC championships. Though, do we see the Jags in this year? Exactly. You so, never know. You, you never, never know. know. Um, I kind of like his weapons there. I was thinking yeah. about it. Robbie Anderson. That's kind of fun. You know. I don't know. I think uh, Bilal Powell. I think uh, they they kind of have some weapons. They kind of have something there. You know, that's kind of... I think Jets fans should be very happy with this draft. Yeah, definitely a great pick. I think the Jets had one of the best top 10 picks. Definitely. I think um, that, Yeah, I think that was the best pick. The Jets, and then the, close second is the Broncos being able to get Chubb. Yeah, Chubb at five is some value. So moving on to later portions of the draft, what picks in the teens really, really got you jazzed up? Uh, one that got me jazzed up, but I wasn't too thrilled about was the Oakland Raiders taking Colt Miller with the 15th pick in the draft. Interesting. So what uh, what did you like or not like about that pick? I think that's a little strange that they drafted Colton Miller with some other really good guys on the board. Um, like Josh Jackson was there. Josh um, Jackson was We'll talk there. about him in a few minutes and his slide. But I don't know. I had Colton Miller going at 18 at the Seahawks. I'm not sure if I like that looking back on it now. Of course, it doesn't matter. But why take Colt Miller with you know so many other players on the board? 
Yeah, for a team with so many deficiencies, especially in the in the in our defense on defense for the Raiders, like even and even going further, their their secondary needs serious help. And at that point, Derwin James was still available, Josh Jackson was still available, Jair Alexander. No, I'm taking that back. Jair Alexander was one pick before. No, they, he wasn't. Marcus Davenport was one pick yep. before. So Jair Alexander was still available. There are all these corners. Is my point. Defensive backs. They just. Passed on so many of them for, and then they decided, Colton you know what? Miller. Colton Miller is is our uh, is our go to guy here. We like that he's six nine, and that's nice. That is so nice. we're gonna draft him. Yeah, exactly. That Honestly, was Sean Green's thought process. Yeah, that probably that's probably exactly what it was. Yeah, um, with that ten year contract guaranteed money, he's like, you know what? Screw it, Colton Miller. He's nice. We'll take him. If I had to guess, the Raiders really wanted Mike McGlinchey. Yeah, and then just didn't know what to do, so they took Colton Miller at fifteen instead. But you also think six picks is enough time, you know, reassess. Exactly. They traded be- They traded out of ten. Like, how, how, at that point, how do you not have a kind of well-constructed plan? I mean, maybe maybe they just have fallen in love with Colton Miller. You know, I, um, I, you know, I need too many hands to count how many times I've been wrong on draft prospects. But, man, I'm not sure what they saw in Colton Miller. Yeah, I don't know. Like, McGlinchey went nine, so they're like, oh, no, what do we do? I guess maybe that's why they traded, so they had more time to think about it. I guess. But I'm just still really shocked that they ended up with Colton Miller after they took, you know, four additional picks to... Yeah, exactly. They, 40 they, minutes. They had their time, yeah. and then they decided, you know what, nope, we're, we're sticking with Colton Miller. So, I mean... Yeah, they were essentially on the clock for much longer than... I mean, know. props to them. If that's the guy they love, that's, if, that's they they be- if that's who they believe is their franchise left tackle, fantastic draft. Because then you traded back and still got the guy you wanted good for you but uh but wow man I, as a chargers fan i am i'm uh, real happy the the raiders had to go with colton miller there uh, uh any teen picks stand out to you jacob uh like i just said as a as a chargers fan getting derwin james at 17 might have been the happiest moment of my chargers fandom i'm not gonna lie this this was LT this, scored 31 touchdowns. I know, I know. That was cool and all, but Derwin James, no. no was this, this better than Young Hoku? Just the idea of Young Hoku. The idea of Young Hoku, Young Hoku versus the idea of Derwin James, man, that's a tough one. Um, I'm not going to lie, I might, have been, I might have been more excited by Young Hoku, but, uh, but regardless, Derwin James is so awesome. He's so much fun to watch play. He's going to revolutionize the Chargers. Like, that, to me, is such a... a scheme defining pick and a sort of defense altering sort of pick just because of what he adds and the he'll just instantly slide in that strong safety role and Gus Bradley like you know he's basically their cam chancellor now mm-hmm. same, same thing Gus Bradley had in Seattle he now brings to Los Angeles I don't know that's gonna be such that's such a fantastic pick and I love him so much I'm so excited Derwin James as a charger because this is finally this is the type of freakish safety prospect that is in demand in the league right now and yep. I I'm still in shock he fell, in, fell to 17. That was I, quite the fall. I don't get that. I will, um, I'm will. i not really sure what teams were missing there. I don't know. I understand that um, the, two, the two picks before, the, yeah, the uh, what you call it, the Raiders and the Ravens right before both have both have people slotted in through strong safety positions. About, you know, they had, um, what you, why am I, the kid out of West Virginia, Carl Joseph for the Raiders yep. and then Tony Jefferson for the Ravens. So I, I understand that you have that position is filled, but man, when there is a prospect of Derwin James ability on the on the board I don't know how you don't take it I don't he should have gone seven picks I think Tampa is gonna regret trading back and yeah. passing on Derwin James yeah uh yeah Vita Vey over Derwin is a that was also is, yeah. is a call is an interesting is an interesting take on the on the um you know for the Buccaneers that yep. really I understand getting that D-line help Vita Bay and Gerald McCoy right next to each other is going to be awesome. It's pretty cool. Do you but, think teams are maybe now drafting more toward their scheme? Like you said, the Chargers, what makes that such a great pick is their scheme. Yeah. Uh, do you think maybe some of the other teams were like, okay, well, he'd be a good pick for us, but this guy, this guy would be a great pick for us. Definitely, definitely. I think um, I think teams are always, scheme, I think is the most important thing when teams are drafting. I think they, they value that even over natural talent, I think, clearly. Like, like we like we saw with a player like Derwin James, I think they, they prioritize fitting him in their scheme. But if your sc- scheme doesn't include people like Derwin James, then your scheme is bad, and your scheme isn't good. You need, to me, that's just a simple case of, that's he's by far the most talented player on the board. Why? Why? Why, have, not? why are we taking him? Why? Why? How could he not help our team? He does so many things well. Even if you have a player in a similar position who does similar things well, you can still use Derwin James to do other things. I don't know. 
Um, and end of the day, though, I'm still psyched that my team got him. I saw I saw Derwin to the Chargers in two separate mock drafts, and both times I'm like, there's no way. That is impossible to me. There is there is no way in hell that he falls to 17, but, uh, but he did. But he did, and as I'm saying this, as I'm saying the words Derwin James is a Charger, just my face lights up and just a smile. It's just just contagious. But, you know, it's, I'm a little happy about the Derwin James pick, yeah. just slightly. Tell us uh, how you really feel, chill. Jacob. <laughs> Uh, so moving on, what are some of the uh, the worst picks of the teens for you? What picks did you really not like? Um, well, we already established Colton Miller. Yeah, that's a that's a rough pick. I was not a huge fan of the Seahawks taking Rashad Penny in the first round. Really? Why why didn't you like them going for Penny? I feel like he would have been there later, if we're being honest. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, there were just so many running backs, and a couple better running backs on the board, if you ask me. Yeah, um, I and, think one of them, Darius Geis. Yeah, like we and they about. went and... He slid, we'll talk about him in a couple minutes, and then you went to, um, Sonny Michelle was on the board before that, and they went with Rashad Penny, so I guess they really liked him. Yeah, clearly they, they just fell in love with that um, tape. He's definitely a really solid running back, but to be your first round pick, um, that shocked me a little bit. Yeah, that was, that was interesting for sure. I mean, I'm not, um, I mean, Rashad Penny probably has one of the best tapes in this draft, honestly, because he set the record for most yards. Like, he he, he dominated in this final season. I mean, half his highlight tape is against Arizona State, so... Exactly, so what is that? 124th ranked defense. Um, but no, but Rashad, I don't know, Rashad Penny's been a lot of fun to watch at San Diego oh, State, sure. and he, so much, I think the thing that discounted him was people were just like, oh, he got fed the ball, he was just, you know, just shoveled the ball, that's why he had that sort of production, but no, he... Even without fantastic blocking, and even when uh, yeah he got the ball a lot, but he was still electric with it with the ball in his hands. He I was just still, don't know about yeah eighteen eighteen is high for sure. Yeah, but if they if they fell in love with Rashad Penny, which I think is pretty easy to do, I get it. I get it. I think that kind of that alleviates the pressure on Russell Wilson. Hopefully, that makes their offensive line a little more. Um, you know, if defenses have bad. if defenses have to truly you know game plan for a productive run offense. That'll make Russell Wilson's life significantly easier. That'll make that offensive line's job easier. The waters, it'll make everyone's job easier. And so, if they truly believe that Rashad Penny is is the next great running back, then good that's for them. A, yeah, good. That's a that's a good pick at eighteen. If this works out, then Pete Carroll will make all of us look stupid. Yeah, wouldn't wouldn't be the first time. Um, I think personally, my least favorite pick of the teens might have been the New Orleans Saints trading up to get a Davenport at fourteen. They, uh, they gave up a future first to move all the way up from, I want to say, 27, 28, late, late 20s all the way up to 14 to take um, Marcus Davenport pass rusher out of UTSA. Now, I did have Davenport going 14 in my mock, but it was to the Packers. But I don't see why the Saints would trade all the way up to 14 and give up that future first. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, this this class was certainly lacking on pass rushers. I get that. You know, I, I understand your your pain there, but man. It just Davenport... seems like a lot to give up for Marcus Davenport. Exactly. Is Davenport really worth two firsts, basically? You know, I mean, yeah, you're moving up, but then you have to give up a future first. I definitely think he was worth the 14th pick, but I don't think he was worth that trade all the way to 14. I agree. I agree. So maybe, you know, like we've been saying, if the, the Saints may have just found their guy. This is this is the perfect person opposite. Cameron Jordan. This will give them the the pass rush they've been lacking. Good for them. I don't know. Um, this just I think he will produce though. I think he's good. I, I don't think this is anything to say against. Just a Davenport. little shocking that they gave up that much. Exactly. Yeah. I just um, I, I don't know how much fall how much farther or how how Davenport wouldn't have fallen. I'm I don't know how quickly he would have been drafted if he hadn't been if you you know they had just stayed at in the late 20s. I don't, I don't know if the Packers would have taken him. You know, Packers, maybe that's where they reach on Josh Jackson or, you know, maybe even Jair Alexander because they clearly had a priority of, you know, yeah. stabilizing their secondary. So maybe... Who they knows? must have known something. Yeah, they they uh, they knew something we didn't. So, yeah. you know, shout out to... Um, shout out to shout shout out to Green Bay. Shout, oh, I was going to say Sean Payton. Him too. Shout out to shout out to Sean... Shout out to everyone involved. So yeah, like we said, the Saints have found their guy. That's a... That's a Great pick, I guess, but man, an extra first is rough. That is rough. So we just talked about Josh Jackson's slide a little bit. Any other big slides? Any other big slides? We talked a lot about Darius Geis on the podcast last yeah. week as a, as a running back prospect. We really liked. Yeah, we left recording, and you asked me, you know, are you hearing about these draft meetings with Darius Geis? And they all, they're all going poorly, and he's like, oh, they asked me weird questions. And then 
think it was last night or the night before I read, uh, the Eagles said Darius Geis was the worst draft meeting that they they've ever had. They got in a screaming match. Yeah. The Eagles and Darius Geis were apparently screaming at each other in their pre-draft interviews. That's a that's that, what I heard. That's a that's not a great sign for Darius Geis. No. Um, then he ended up with the Eagles division rivals in Washington. I'm kind of excited. I want to see him face yeah, them. I think uh, that'll definitely give Darius Geis some extra fire when they play each other. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm interested to see what they were screaming about because the Eagles... Their ownership, their GM, How, uh, Howie Roseman, uh, Jeffrey Lurie, they're pretty chill guys. They're pretty accepting guys. Like They're not going to s- s- scream at you for practically no reason. Yeah, the Eagles are not one of these Something you know, super... Something must have gone terribly wrong. It's, let's put it this way. It's not the Texans owner that we're talking about right Exactly, now. exactly. Yes. These, this is certainly one of the more accepting franchises in the league. Um, I would assume... Would, I mean, I think we've heard in the past about some really weird, strange draft questions and... I would not be shocked to hear if the, the Eagles ask something kind of insensitive or crossing a line. I mean, you have a you know you have a great little tidbit about about Des Bryant. Des Bryant was really close to being a Dolphin, and uh, ownership and front office asked, you know, what's your mom do? And uh, well, more specifically, they asked if she was a lady of the evening, and obviously Des Bryant didn't like that, and I don't blame him for not. Yeah, liking shock, that question. shocker, shocker. So you know, if you don't want to play for a team that asks about your that asked even if that, that is your mother's occupation. Insinuating your mom's a prostitute? Yeah. That that's is a, very bad. Um, not to say the Eagles did anything of that nature, but it wouldn't. it's not like out of the realm of possibility to me that they ask insensitive or just overall strange questions. I could see strange, and I could honestly just see Darius guys just being a little bit cocky. Yeah, and, I could definitely And that's see. what led to the argument. It happens, happens a lot. Jarvis Landry and Adam Gase did not like each other. You know what it might have been? It might have been that the Eagles asked him if he can accept a role as like a third or fourth running back. Because the Eagles have like three running backs on their team. Now they have four again with Sproles. Maybe they were thinking about re-signing Sproles. They asked him, hey, you comfortable being three, four on this uh, running back roster? That's what it might have been. I Maybe. can see Darius Geis not liking that question. Definitely. Yeah. I, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if he like screamed at that. You know, that'd be, I don't know how that would, that'd be a... It'd be an interesting screaming match, but you know, I, I if I had to guess, I, I would assume it's something personal. I would assume it's something like in his past, you know, and they're digging deep on research. Because I would assume other teams have asked him, "Hey, are you cool taking a limited role?" You know, but if, yeah, if the that's, Eagles, that's probably a common question. If the Eagles found something in his past or found something like, "Hey, you know, why exactly whatever, whatever, whatever happened here?" Yeah, exactly. I, I can't. Darius guys didn't like that question. I don't know. Um, trying to avoid any uh, cliche pop culture references. But the only people that really know what happened are the people that were in the confines of that meeting. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think we'll ever know. If uh, you can uh, get the cliche pop culture reference, um, good for you. Yeah, props to you. That's uh, a, you guys know what I'm talking about? I have no idea. So, uh, you know, yeah, that's if, if a, our listeners yeah. get it, good for yeah. them. It's from Hamilton. No one else was in the room where it happened. Ah, um, okay. Ah, so. so I know a few of our listeners will get that. Yeah, right? exactly. Hamilton's been really worn out in our friend group. Yeah, screw you, Patrick. Yeah. Um... So one, one last quick thing about Darius, guys, before we move on to other slides. The only other thing I think it could be um, is the Eagles were kind of concerned that the Philly media would get to him about it. Maybe they asked him kind of a leading question. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Giants and the Jets did similar things because they're in New York. Uh, and maybe the Redskins didn't ask him that question because the Washington media isn't known for digging deep like that. That is true. They Maybe. could have just given him practice reporter questions, and yeah. he reacted poorly. Um, definitely a good theory. Um, I think we'll find out eventually. I, I think hope either so. the Eagles or Darius guys will come out. Yeah, whoever whoever feels or the most agent. whoever feels the most wronged will probably yeah. release something. You know, either on purpose or you know, it'll just happen. accidentally. Yeah, exactly. with accidentally, their quotes. bingo! Accidentally with air quotes. Uh, so moving on to the end of the first. Couple, couple surprising picks here. Um, teams trading up, tra- teams trading back into the first. New England Patriots had two first, two picks in this uh, in this range, the twenty to thirty range. Tell me, tell me, what are your takeaways from that? Um, I like the idea of drafting Isaiah Wynn and Sony Michelle for I the New England Patriots. I think it's cool Patriots. to have you know college running back running behind his college offensive lineman. I think that's cool. Um, plus, I think Sonny Michelle is a really good pick. I had him going 32 to the Eagles, but I like him in New England a lot. 
Me too. I think he's definitely an upgrade over Dion Lewis. Um, he can do everything Dion Lewis does, but a little bit better. And is younger. And yes. is, you know, got four years on him. Yep. And that's why I really like Sonny Michelle in New England. I like that. I um, I think he's going to fit in perfectly. Like we just yep. said, you know, I think he's going to fit in perfectly in that system and that culture. Um, I think, I like you said, I think Isaiah Wynn is a fantastic pick. Yep. I'm curious to see where he stays long term. Because at Georgia, he played a lot of left tackle and he was yeah. awesome at it. He was fantastic. But... He met, he comes in at a little a little under six three, so you know criminally undersized for a tackle. But the, if he has the ability, I think a team like the Patriots could definitely talk themselves into keep him at left tackle. You know, just thinking to themselves, okay, we understand he's not prototypical size, but he has he has shown the production at the highest levels of college football to succeed at left tackle. Let's let him stay there. Let's see, and if they can get a franchise left tackle at twenty three, that is a that's Very a hell good. of a pick. You know, so if that if that's how that plays out, which I think it very well may, great draft for the Patriots. You know, that's a guy why the Raiders pass on. Exactly, exactly. What do you? I mean, I, they're two very different prospects, but, but Isaiah Wynn production, Colt Miller potential. I'm taking production over potential yeah. ten times out of ten. Um, I, we I guess really don't like that Colton Miller pick. Keeps no, no, up. I think the Colton Miller pick is the uh, the sideline intel least favorite pick of the draft. Yeah, we might have to. Uh... We might have to make that an official thing. Just <laughs> Screw Colton Miller. Best pick and worst pick. <laughs> um, all right, so another slide. I know you really wanted the Chargers to take this guy. I did. Um, or actually, um, we could talk about that last pick of the first round before we get into that player you really wanted the Chargers to have. And the last pick being Lamar Jackson to the Ravens. Yeah, I think that's a huge storyline. Let's, uh, yeah, I think it'd be criminal to, I can't to just we gloss over. Forgot that. Yeah, I can't, I, can't I hate gloss. myself for skipping over that. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I, I don't know how you forgot Lamar. Ja- Lamar Jackson might have been the might have been the most interesting pick of the first round to me, just in terms of what they definitely the most intriguing. Just the thought process of the Ravens to you know have a first round pick, get Hayden Hurst in the middle of the yep. first. And I don't trade. like that Hayden Hurst pick. No, me either. I would have liked the Lamar better at. Exactly. They what get, was it? Twenty six. Was the second trade back was yeah. What was it? Twenty five. Twenty because it was a yeah. Titan, so twenty five. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lamar twenty five is perfect to me. I thought the Ravens were the first time they traded back when they traded back from sixteen to um, to I think twenty yeah twenty two because it was right before the Patriots. Mm-hmm. Uh, my thinking was okay. Patriots have intel that or Ravens have intel the Patriots want Lamar. So they traded up one pick before them so they could get him. And then they took a 26-year-old. Yeah, then they took a 26-year-old former baseball player. Uh, yeah, that was a... That That's was a, a weird pick to me. That is. But they made up for Lamar. Yeah, Lamar. There, and there were two better tight ends on the board at that time, and Jasicki and Goddard. Definitely. I, you could even make the argument for three. You could have those two and maybe Mark Andrews. Like, yeah. I, I'm not crazy high on Hayden Hurst. Yeah, that was weird. But I definitely like Lamar. Um, he sits this year, most likely. Do you think he, Do you think he starts a game this year? For sure. Um, yeah. Joe Flacco, uh, past couple years, a little bit injury prone. Yeah. Getting a little older. Definitely. Um, I think Lamar starts, I'll say, at least two games this year. Interesting. Do you think the play- the, Eagle- the Eagles, the Ravens are in playoff contention? Do you think Lamar starts games that matter? Yes, but I think Joe Flacco comes back. Interesting. So you think it's more because of injury than benching for Flacco? Yes. Okay. Unless it's one of those games where Flacco throws five picks in the first half at Nathan Peterman. Um, have you uh, have both of you ruled out a potential trade of Flacco? Yeah, his contract is the biggest in the league. I, I doubt it. He's any. just too old and what if there's a team not the biggest anymore. That's been so. clearing out some salary cap space in Miami. Interesting. That has some space to pay somebody like a Joe Flacco. I think a um, a quarterback grouping of Flacco, Tannehill, and Os- and Brock Osweiler. I don't know how you're not succeeding with uh with that trio right there. That's just three proven winners. I don't know. That's like a Hall of Fame quarterback <laughs> trio just based on their mediocrity. <laughs> just, it's so mediocre that it's amazing. I think mediocre might be a little uh, too strong a word. I think uh, I think below average probably. Well, Flacco has a Super Bowl. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Tannehill is thrown for four thousand a couple times. Brock. Um, went to ASU. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's forks tall. up. It's tall and went to ASU. Yeah. So basically, he's pretty. You know. Yeah. If you combine them, you get a pretty good quarterback. Bingo. Bingo. So, uh, so Lamar. So okay. Here's my question to you: If the Ravens are in playoff contention the whole year, like similar to how they were last year, and Flacco doesn't get hurt, does Lamar play? Does Lamar start and does Lamar play? No. 
No to Unless both. he has to. Okay. That's that's kind of my thinking. I don't think that I think the Ravens are gonna be fine. They're gonna be similar to last year. I think they're gonna be around nine and seven, eight and eight, ten and six, somewhere in that range. They're gonna be in the wild card, you know, hunt. And so that's why I don't think Lamar plays. I don't think they uh I kinda hope they're really bad. So we see Lamar. I would I would you know, similar to the Cardinals. I, I would be psyched that they were like two and eight. And then we got to see Lamar for the, you know, last third of the year. I think that'd be really exciting. That'd be some good experience for him. But also in Baltimore, they're like a lack of weapons. That's what I would be most worried about for Lamar's future. Mm-hmm. While Base Josh Rosen, this year, exactly they, you know, Josh Rosen and Baker Mayfield and even Josh Allen to a certain extent have kind of been surrounded with some better weapons. It's just going to be how worth it is it to play Lamar this year? Do you just throw out RG three instead? Maybe if Ooh. they're that bad. Interesting. Yeah, do they just ride it out? Yeah, and maybe I wouldn't be shocked. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't be. I'm curious to see how much faith they have in Lamar. If they're really bad, do they go and get a franchise quarterback? Do they go and get one of these, you know, top flight quarterbacks from for next year's class? Who knows how this Ravens team? I think this this Ravens team is certainly at a crossroads. I think they see a future in Lamar if they're going to trade up to get him in the first. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I think at least for the next, I'll say two seasons, the Ravens abstain from drafting another quarterback, unless it's someone they're confident is going to be the backup. Yeah, unless they probably get a top five pick. Ooh, oh, you oh, interesting. So you don't think they draft any quarterback? No. Even if they're horrible, and there's there's a you know, um, and if the Ravens go two and fourteen this year, get the first pick in the draft, I still don't think they draft a quarterback. I think they probably say, you know what, Joe, it's Lamar's turn, and then they draft someone for Lamar or someone for the defense. Okay. And they go from there. I like it. I like it. I'm curious to see how this. Um, this is a this is a cool franchise move for them. Lamar Jackson is the Ravens' quarterback of the future. Oh, I see Newsom's last draft getting the uh, getting their quarterback of the future. That is my. Uh, I don't want to call it a hot take because I think it's a realistic take, but I definitely see a good career in Baltimore. Yeah, I for agree. Lamar Jackson. I agree. Um, I think yeah, that just makes a lot of sense. I think if they surround him with some more weapons and really kind of build that team around him. I think we talked about this pre-draft. Lamar Jackson, with a team built around him, might be the most successful quarterback from this class. Yeah. So, we shall see. We shall see. Uh, so, I think that kind of wraps up the first round. Um, let's, we, we alluded to it a little earlier, but let's talk about some of these prospects that found one in the uh, second round and farther. Uh, well, we already talked about Josh Jackson and Darius Geis. Um, and then I'll bring up that guy you really wanted on the Chargers, and that is Maurice Hurst. Yeah. Um, and then they passed on him yeah, three more times. They passed on him. They passed on him. No, yes, you're right, three times. They passed on the second, third, and fourth. And that. And then he ended up with your most hated team, uh, the Raiders. I was ready to give the Raiders like a D for their draft. And we, then they got Maurice Hurst. They, Ar- they got Arden Key and then Maurice Hurst in back to back picks and back to back rounds. Mm-hmm. And I love both those picks. I'm so mad that they got them. Of yeah. all the teams. Colton Miller definitely still drags down their grade for me. Oh, of course, of course. Um, but yeah. they had a very good. Second half of the draft. Oh my god, Arden Key in the fourth is odd. He is fantastic. That is that is a third. I take that back. I think he's a third. Um, that is a fantastic value pick. He's going to be a instant contributor next to Cleo Mack. And then Maurice Hurst is just so good. Maurice Hurst was awesome at Michigan, and then he fell for for these weird reasons. No one's. Um, is it the heart condition? They say it's the heart condition. They say oh, some teams had him completely off their draft board because of the heart condition. But on the other hand. Combine doctors cleared him yeah. once he, you know. We so also, a- after that initial scare at the combine, his second clearing with the combine, he was clean. I could see just teams not really wanting to draft a guy like Maurice Hurst because they don't have to. I guess, but man. Um, but you get into those later rounds and you see a player that good, you know, why are you not for capitalizing the, on For that? the Chargers specifically, they drafted Justin Jones, a attack. A, Interior defensive lineman in the third round at NC State, and he's uh he's solid. I think he's gonna be fine. But Maurice wow. Hurst is Maurice Hurst at that pick would have been incredible. Would have been just out of this world. I don't know. I, I don't know what I would have done if we left it. If we landed both Derwin James and Maurice Hurst, I don't. I don't think I would have lived to see past that night. I think I would. That that's where you just fall into a euphoric coma and yeah. and never come out. That is that would be an unreal draft. That was but. weird to me. I. I um, thought if he might not he might not go in the first yeah that, was, uh, that wouldn't have been as surprising to me but the fact that he fell to the fifth to the fifth all the way to the fifth man I mean I 
sometimes, man, NFL GMs, I just, I just don't get it. In, in the NBA, not to, not to change subjects too crazily, but in the NBA, I have pretty much full faith in, in ninety percent of GMs. Probably twenty eight out of the thirty GMs, I have pretty, pretty strong faith in. In the NFL, half, if that. I think, I think the general managers in the NFL are so incompetent. There are really good ones. And there are, there are re- there's no in between it feels like i kind of have this theory that the NF- the really good ones aren't that good just the bad ones are freaking idiots and they just can't they don't know how to draft and they don't know how to build team i don't know i mean i'm probably speaking out my ass as a as a you know nfl podcaster but man there're just some times when when what are they seeing in these prospects or what are they not seeing that someone like Maurice Hurst isn't worth a fourth round pick uh, i just want to throw in a quick note jeff griffith walked behind us and gave us a very obscene gesture so i can't wait to hear what he has to say or mm-hmm. what we had to say yeah. about him earlier in this podcast i hope he listens to it he definitely will. hi again jeff we yeah. still hate you still hate you so uh so moving on any any other prospects that you really felt like slid or or were first you had first round grades on that maybe didn't go into the second or third possibly a, a cowboys new cowboys wide receiver that you really fell in love with yeah michael gallup yeah, really well, fell in love with him. It didn't go to the third round, but kind of fits into the perfect place. Yeah, um, I think they got a steal. I also thought Cortland Sutton was going to go in the first round, too. I've had him going to Dallas, and he fell out. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, James Washington, another first-round guy. Um, that was a weird draft for me, but for Jacksonville. Interesting. Um, what didn't you like about it? They need receivers, and that's really just not what they pursued. No, no, it didn't seem like that was an emphasis. They got DJ Chark. I think that's probably their best pick, though. Yeah, the rest of those picks are... They I wasted mean, a pick on Tanner Lee. Yeah, that was a weird pick. He was... Okay, if... For Josh Allen, I understand making excuses for why he was bad in college. Yeah. You know, he was surrounded by poor talent, whatever, gonna improve. Tanner Lee was trash at Nebraska. And I don't really understand what the like. What is the trajectory for him? What, There's not a better free agent quarterback yeah, I, you can bring in as a backup. Honestly, Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, how is? I yeah, don't know. I don't know. That Tanner Lee pick is weird to me. Yeah. Plus, there were still some, you know, receivers on the board in the sixth round. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a special where you can find immense value in. I think um, I'm not exactly sure, but I would imagine Equinomia St. Brown was yeah. still. Was still available then? I don't know. Taven um, Bryan is good, but they definitely did not need to make that pick, and they could have gotten a much better receiver. Yeah, I don't like that pick at all, Taven Bryan. I was not crazy on him coming out of the draft. Um, to me, you know, I, I, I see the potential. I see those flashes of, of dominance and just If they speed. really wanted a tackle, and they saw Maurice Hurst falling. Yeah, I mean, So why not draft a receiver first and then pick up that defensive lineman? And I, I just do not understand their thinking with this draft. Especially because you got to the AFC Championship last game on the ba- on the backs of your defense. And I understand improving improving your strengths. I get that. But at some point... You also when, have to improve your weaknesses. When you have such deficiencies on the other side of the ball, why not? A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Bingo. Exactly. So you Not know. a pop culture reference. No, just a... Or kind of a pop culture reference. What, what show was that? Was that The Apprentice where they used to say that? I don't or, know. Um, I just, that's a dumb cliche I hear. There's some there's some TV show that said it. Um, if the listeners know, let us know. But yeah, who um, who is that red haired lady, um, who is friend who? Okay, Ozzy Osbourne. Who is Ozzy Osbourne's sister? What is her name? Um, his wife is Sharon. Is you don't think of his wife? I don't know. Regardless, she. Oh, I don't remember. Jacob's her thinking of something. Yeah, who knows? We're just we're going off on a tangent. Nah, nobody else really knows where it's going. So, uh, so let's let's get this back on track. Uh, let's talk about teams as a whole. We have a couple teams picked out as who we thought had our favorite drafts. Yeah. And uh, let's just go through their draft classes, and and we can tell the listeners why we really hated them, or why we really love them, or hate yeah, I just them. told you why I hated Jacksonville. So why don't you uh, give us one you liked? Okay, I'll uh, I'll start with one I liked. I really liked the Cincinnati Bengals draft. Um, I don't think that's a that's a take you're gonna hear a whole lot. I've been kind of, you know, checking out other people's draft rankings, seeing where they had them. A lot of people have them in like the B minus, C plus, maybe you know, B plus range. I I thought they had one of the best drafts in the um, in the league. I really did. So their top four picks, they had Billy Price, the center out of Iowa State, in the first. Then Jesse Bates, the third, a safety out of Wake Forest. Sam Hubbard, and then back to back picks in the third. 
They got Sam Hubbard, Hubbard, an edge rusher at Ohio State, and then Malik Jefferson, a linebacker out of Texas. That's a very good draft. And those top four to me elevates you into top five draft status to me. That is, those are four probably day one starters who each have really transferable skills to the NFL. Um, I'm not going to go in super in depth on all of them, but Billy Price was proficient in both the run and pass game. He's a little more, he excelled a little more in the pass game. He's going to be a um, that, I think that's where his strengths will lie, but he's probably a 10-year starter. Uh, Jesse Bates was a true kind of one-high single coverage safety. He's going to you know, be able to patrol the field. He can't do a whole lot else, but what he does well, he does really well. So that'll be great for them. Sam Hubbard, coming off the edge for Ohio State, had the highest three-cone score of any, had the, had the fastest three-cone time of any edge rusher in the, in the draft. And we know Bill Belichick, that's, that is the... That is the metric he looks at to kind of determine, you know, what how success will translate from college to NFL. And I really like Sam Hubbard. He produced at Ohio State. He had a good combine and going in the third. That's huge. And then Malik Jefferson, also in the third. That's a former five-star recruit out of Texas, a linebacker. He, he didn't really excel in his first two seasons in Arlington, but his final year there, he kind of showed some flashes. And to get that sort of pedigree in the third, to me, is exceptional. Uh, so give yep. give me uh, give me a team you really liked. Team I liked draft wise, the Green Bay Packers. I think of a good draft, and I think of a team that really set out to improve on what they have or don't have, and that is exactly what the Green Bay Packers did in this draft. They took a secondary that was pretty bad last year, and then they lost arguably their best player in Demarius Randall, and then they added Jair Alexander in the first, and Josh Jackson in the second. Um, I credit a lot of this good draft to Josh Jackson's slide, but the Packers were smart enough to take him, and that is a very good draft, Um, even just those two picks. I mean, Um, they also helped their, you know, lacking receiving core, getting Equinami of St. Brown in the six. That's huge. That's a a fantastic pick. I like him. Yeah, I mean, you know, 6'3", I want to say. Didn't drop maybe six balls, I think, in his time at Notre Dame. He is. He fell for some kind of unknown reasons. I'm not really... I don't know how somebody with that sort of natural talent falls. And he can speak three languages. Exactly. The kid's a genius. So I'm not really sure what teams weren't falling in love well, there. His name is Equinemius. Like, <laughs> yeah. what more do you want from Honestly. a football player? Cool name. Genius. Good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Talented. Went to a, you know, big... Went to a football factory, you know. And then anyway, nope. Sixth round pick. Yep. So uh, the second team, second team's draft class I really, really enjoyed was the uh, Detroit Lions. Similar to the Bengals, I, I have not seen a whole lot of love for the Lions, but I think that's unfair. I think they had a super deep draft class, and I really like the way they used their picks. Um, in the first, they got Arkansas center Frank Ragnow. Um, he's been kind of flying up draft boards as a kind of unheralded pick out of Arkansas, but he really produced in his time there. He was he was incredibly consistent, and I think it's just hard to get recognition as an offensive lineman. Yeah. So I would not be shocked to see if he's the best offensive lineman to come out of this class. That would not shock me at all. Second round, they got Auburn running back Carrion Johnson. I think a lot of people didn't like that pick. I think a lot, a lot of people would have wanted maybe Darius Geister or Ronald Jones was still on the board, I believe. Um, so they, I think a lot of people felt they reached on that running back. But yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, I, I wasn't wasn't super fluent in carry on Johnson. It seems like a reach, but it's also a good pick. But with wa- an inconsistent running game that they have. And watching his tape, he he excelled in the you know and Auburn. He's he's excelling against the the toughest defenses college football has to offer. In the SEC. And he and he is making you know future NFL stars look silly. He has he has some speed. He has size. He has the ability to you know to really muscle through tackles, but also just burn them off the edge. I think he's he's going to be exciting to watch. And then in the fourth, they got it. In the third, they got Tracy Walker, a safety out of Louisiana. Um, not much. I don't think that's a fantastic pick. But in the fourth, they got Alabama Alabama defensive lineman Deshaun Hand, who at this time last year was a projected top five, top ten pick. This guy has such incredible natural talent and just a physique and intangibles that translate so well at that position that there are just so few humans on the planet. Who are, I want to say he's like 6'4, six, 6'5, six, and have the agility and fluidity and speed that he does to get that kind of talent in the fourth round, especially a guy coming out of Alabama. I think when in doubt, draft those Alabama guys because more times than not, they're so overshadowed by the talent around them mm-hmm. that once they get to the NFL, it's almost like a talent 
decrease for them and they're they're easy it's easier for them to slot into a a true role and i think that was a the, that was washington's thought process behind selecting deron Payne. um and i think that's the same thought process here the lions had with deshaun hand and then the fifth my fa- my my final and probably favorite pick of their draft is tyrell crosby a uh, offensive tackle out of oregon got him in the fifth round he's allowed one sack in the past two seasons playing in the pac-12 he is kind of just, he has been the anchor on that Oregon offensive line. We know he has the ability to play with a up-tempo style. Because obviously, that's all they do there in, up in Eugene. He has the ability to run with the best of them. He's still a physical physical specimen, though. I think he's 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, so, you know, he got the size to really stay at the tackle position long term. To get that kind of guy in the fifth round, big fan. So, uh, moving on to your second team. Uh, Who's the second draft class you liked? Second team for me... Uh... The Tennessee Titans, first round, they took one of those Alabama guys you were talking about in Rashawn Evans. And then in the second, they took linebacker Harold Landry from Boston College. Uh, the Titans only had four picks in this draft. And then they took a safety and then Luke Falk out of Washington State to back up Mariota. But I think the uh, two early picks, they nailed them. Uh, they really needed linebackers. And I think about linebackers like you think about corners is you can never have too many of them. So I, plus it's the position where they were thin, and they added two star linebackers, essentially two first round talents, except they got one of them in the second round. And yeah. That's what I liked about the Titans draft. Harold Landry is going to be awesome. Yes, for them. he is so good, and he fell for weird reasons. You know, there mm-hmm. was there wasn't really any personality concerns there. It was just kind of a production drop off. Yeah, I think it's mostly just the tape from twenty seventeen as opposed to sixteen that it's, caused that. It's insane. I mean you look at his twenty sixteen tape and that is a that's a freak of nature. That is a awesome pass rusher who, you know, any team would covet. But I'd have to imagine though it's tough to keep your head in it all the way when you're losing so many games like Boston College is. You're losing so many games like Boston College is. You're constantly double teamed, you know? I mean, there's no one else on that Boston College roster even close to that sort of talent level, you know? So, um... It's rough. Yeah, exactly. I... That's that's a that's a criminal falling for me. I yes. think that is a... That will look really... That will look really stupid and, like, probably instantly, I think. Yeah, I think Harold Landry... Had the Titans not gotten him, they would have had a bad draft, I think. I agree. If they, I mean, obviously, depending on... But the fact that there. they got him and Rashawn Evans, that uh, that boosted their grade for me. I agree. And so, uh, my final team, the uh, this this pains me to say, but I think the Denver Broncos had a fantastic draft. Um, I think this one's a little... I think probably other people picked up on this one as well. I mean, when you get Bradley Chubb at five, that's a fantastic way to start your draft. But that's not where it ends for me for the Broncos. The fact that they got Bradley Chubb at the fifth, and then Cortland Sutton earlier in the second, really nice. That's a that's a really good weapon that they don't really possess. On like Der- Demarius Thomas used to be that kind of mm-hmm. go up and get the ball weapon, but the fact that they can kind of get his younger replacement, Cor- Cortland Sutton, make things that much easier for Case Keenum. And then third, they got Royce Freeman, a running back out of Oregon. Not my favorite running back tr- prospect in this class, but the fact they got him in the third, I- I'd much rather have Royce Freeman in the third than Rashad Penny in the first. You know that to mm-hmm. me. I think there's a lot of value in that pick. Exactly. Sure. I think it, they the, the um, them hitting on that pick would not surprise me. I think Royce Freeman is going to have a, a long and solid NFL career. And then skipping over a pick day in the fourth, they got Josie Joel at a linebacker out of Iowa. Um, he his tape just reminds me of your classic middle linebacker thumper, just sort of that that sort of tradition, very traditional. Very, very limited linebacker prospect, but does the things he needs to do very well. He, you know, he's he's in the right positions whenever he, you know, he's in the right time, right positions at all times. He attacks the ball, he runs downhill, but he's also excellent in coverage. He didn't allow a single touchdown in his final season at Iowa. I think he was one of the better coverage linebackers in the country. So I think that's a that's a, he just doesn't jump off the page physically. Mm-hmm. He's not an exceptional athlete. I think he might be even a below average. I call him a below average athlete. But a good football player. But a great football player. And those are the kind of guys you want on your. You need those kind of guys yeah. on your team. That's kind of what brings. That's a, a very a very unifying type of player. A very a glue guy, as a, as one might say. And then ended not the end of the draft, but my fa- my final favorite pick for them was Troy Fumagalli, a tight end out of Wisconsin in the fifth round, um, in a draft. Stacked with athletic pass catching tight ends, Fumagalli I think to me was one of the underrated ones that fell. 
he tested off the charts of the combine, not not Gusecki levels, but he still proved himself I think, to be a better athlete than a lot of people anticipated. And if you can get 80% of that athleticism in the fifth round, that's some value. So I really like that. Yeah, for sure. So moving on to your right. final team. Who so do you got? my final team, because what's a football conversation without me talking about the Dolphins, is the Miami Dolphins. Um, not just because I like them, but I think they did have a really good draft. They were able to take Minka Fitzpatrick at 11, which is obviously a steal for a guy like that. Um, he'll add to his secondary with Rashad Jones, TJ McDonald, Xavier Howard, um, and Cordray Tankersley. Um, I think that'll be a really good defensive backfield. And then they kept going with these you know, solid picks. In the second round, they took Mike Jasicki, a pass-catching tight end. In the third, they take Jerome Baker, linebacker out of Ohio State. Um, that's a, that's going to be really cool because, you know, him and Raekwon McMillan next to each other, both from Ohio State, I that looks really good in my head, and I can really see them just tearing it up for the Dolphins linebacking core along with Kiko Alonso, who, you know, is all right. <laughs> I like to think of that pick six against the Chargers when I think of Kiko Alonso. Yeah, I like to not think about that. Uh, it's such a great play. Um, and then they took Kalen Balazs, Arizona State. Um, like him because, you know, Arizona State. Durham Smythe, they're uh, blocking tight end. Um, tight end's a position where they pretty much had none of them on their roster, no one of note. Julius Thomas didn't work out, and Anthony Fasano is pretty old, and I'm pretty sure he's gone at this point. So, you know, they brought in two new guys, one that can block and one that can catch, and I think that's really going to benefit them. And then adding another linebacker, Quentin Poling from the University of Ohio, or Ohio University. Um, I just like the idea of adding another linebacker. Because, like I said earlier, something you can't have too many of. So that's why I think the Dolphins had a great draft. In terms of picking exactly what they needed, I think the Dolphins had one of the better drafts in terms of doing that. I can get with that. I think they, they filled a lot more holes than I think a lot of teams did. And that's why I gave them such a good grade is because they... Uh, they filled the holes. I don't know if it'll work out. You never really do. Yeah, who knows? But um, the fact that they, the effort was there to clearly improve where they were weak, uh, that's what gave them such a good draft for me. I like it. I like it. Um, with that in mind, um, I think that wraps up this episode of Two Kids in a Trench Coat. Any, any parting thoughts, Ryan? Oh, man. Just what a crazy draft season. Yeah. I had a lot of fun, you know, covering it. It me definitely too. it kept me up at night just thinking about what was gonna happen. And uh, you know, I was losing sleep, but you know, I enjoyed laying there awake thinking about what was gonna happen. Yeah. So And now and now the summer really begins. I uh, yeah, I'm ready for training camp. Yeah, really. OTAs feel like should be tomorrow. I yeah. I am ready for football yeah. to start. You know damn well as soon as there's a training camp fight, we'll be hot be behind this microphone we will we will be here providing you loyal listeners with all of the intel you need on sideline intel side <laughs> on all of the stuff you need for training camp fights odds and everything exactly exactly uh, and of course we got to thank josh for being our producer yeah josh any any final words any any final thoughts on the eagles draft or just a draft as a whole uh draft as a whole thought it was an interesting draft especially the first round uh, the Eagles draft, um, I thought it was interesting, and we're going to see a rugby player um, suit up in Eagles green soon. So. That's going to be fun. I watched, Never played it down in football. I watched his highlight tape last night, though. That kid is he's a tank. awesome. He's 6'8", and he just runs through kids. Without pads. Yeah, he's just like, nah, yeah, no. I'm not too pass. worried about that, if we're being honest. I'm well, not worried he said he's never... Not worried oh, that oh, he's never played football. Gotcha, yeah, I care less. If he can learn the playbook, he'll be just fine. Yeah, I think it was just like a for fun pick. Like, oh, there's nobody else in the seventh round that we really want. So let's, let's just take, take, take let's crazy. take a tank. He's gonna be a tackle though, and that's the part I don't like. I want him to be like a fullback or a running back. Like, yeah. I want him to have the ball in his hands. Oh, man, he, I can do a whole podcast on the fullback. I think being he registered honest. as a tackle, but I think the Eagles are gonna put him where they need to. Play. Okay, cool. I want I want wide receiver. I want this kid to just have to, you know, body kids in the end zone and, and go up for balls. That's what I'm hoping for. Maybe, you got Moss maybe. by someone who's two times bigger than Randy Moss. Exactly. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, um, we'll see where that goes. So, yeah. So, uh, I am. I love this draft. This was an awesome draft to really cover and care intently. You know, I think um, 
definitely compared to the past couple ones, a little more, a little more excitement filled. And personally, mm-hmm. as a Chargers fan, this is this was awesome. It, as a fan, for me, it was a great draft. And, yeah. So. Yeah. So um, until until next year's draft, I guess we're just gonna have to we'll just have to watch football. I guess yeah. I don't know. I guess I have to watch the regular. And what are we gonna talk about on yeah, an NFL the, podcast? <laughs> yeah. Now that we don't have the draft, I have no idea what to talk about for the next twelve months. But yeah. uh, we'll find something. I yeah. Uh, I, sure I have we... faith in us. We'll find something. All right, and uh, that's that's it. So, have a good one, folks.